this is going to be verse by verse of First John chapter 2. And we're going to look at Bible believers' worst enemies. What are some of the worst enemies that we have as born-again Bible-believing Christians? And just jumping right into it, the number one enemy for most of us is the flesh. Something, something you need to know is that ever since you were born again, your flesh is dead. It likes to rise back up and have its way in your life again. And you just have to keep pushing it back down. Uh, remember those punching bags you used to play with as a kid? You would punch it and then it just comes right back up again. And then you punch it and it comes right back up. That's how your flesh is. You just have to keep punching it back down. Now don't literally go punch yourself in the face or something. But you see what I mean. I mean if your flesh had a pleasure button on it, it would push it till it died. The Bible says she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. So the first enemy to put your crosshairs on as a soldier of Jesus Christ is your own extremely wicked flesh. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1 says, My little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So why do we still sin? Because we still have the same sinful flesh. The same flesh you had before you were saved, you still have it. And you do sin, as John said in the previous chapter. And you, you can't deny it. You look at that woman you're not supposed to look at. You lie. Even if it's just with a facial expression, you tell a lie. Uh, you accidentally snigger at a dirty joke. Uh, you watch something on TV you shouldn't have watched. I mean, you're consistently habitually sinning every day of your life the thought of foolishness is a sin him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him it is a sin uh, in 1 Corinthians fifteen thirty one, Paul says I die daily you have to die to sin every day of your life we don't have to sin but that's what we end up doing and a Calvinist said if I have free will then why can't I stop sinning but he's forgetting that every sin he committed, he did it on purpose. And God didn't make you do it. Some of the greatest verses on the struggle with the flesh is in Romans chapter 6. So if you turn over to Romans chapter 6 and look at verse 11, it says, Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So your flesh was crucified with Christ, so it's dead. And you have to keep reminding it that it's dead. You have to nail it to the cross and shoot it back into the grave. There's people who believe that the spirit of humans, after they're dead, roam around on earth. And they also believe that they sometimes have to help those spirits cross over. Which is dumb because those are unclean spirits just pretending to be your, your dead mammal, your dead grandfather. But that's the way you have to do the flesh. It sticks around after you get saved. It doesn't want to go into the grave, but you have to keep pushing it back into the grave. Just say, you're dead, man. You're dead. Tell the, It says, reckon your flesh is dead. Uh, Romans 6.12 says, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. So a Christian can allow sin to reign in his mortal body. And many times they won't show a changed life. And that goes to show that how God sees me in the sense of salvation is different than how people see me when it comes to my fruit. Uh, Romans 6.13 says, Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of, of righteousness unto God. So just like God gives us the choice on whether or not to believe on Jesus Christ to be saved, he gives us the choice to either yield to the Holy Spirit's leading or choose the flesh. Romans sixteen fourteen and 15. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law but under grace. What then shall we sin? Because we are not under the law but under grace? God forbid. So just because we aren't under the law doesn't mean we should live for ourselves doesn't mean we should still sin. He said, 
should we sin since we're not under the law but under grace? He says, God forbid. So the flesh is our most persistent enemy. It's there when you wake up. It's there when you're at work. It's there when you're with your family. It's there when you go to bed. It's there when you take a shower. It hates cold water. It wants the best food. It wants the warmest, warmest clothes. It wants air conditioning. It wants to be pampered. And the more you pamper it, the stronger you make it. First John 2, 1 says, My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So we still end up sinning in the flesh. But if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And an advocate pleads our cause. It pleads... A, a, it's there in the, in the middle for us. When we die, the devil will say, look at all the sinning he did. Uh, he'll say he ought to be in hell for all that sin he did. But then Jesus Christ, our advocate, steps in and says, he did sin, but I became sin for him and died for him. And John calls our advocate Jesus Christ the righteous. And if he is righteous, then we are righteous because of him. And this is called imputed righteousness. If I'm in the body of Christ and the Lord uh, doesn't have a sinful bone in his body, then what does that say about me? In the eyes of God, I'm sinless when it comes to my salvation. And Romans 4, 6 through 8 says, Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. So Jesus Christ is righteous, and we get his righteousness the moment we believe on him. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Not only do we get Jesus imputed righteousness, but he also doesn't count our own unrighteousness to our record. And how God sees us in Christ, as I've talked about so many times, is different than how he sees our daily Christian walk. In Christ I'm sinless, and that's my standing. My state however, is however I'm living at any given moment which can be good or it can be bad. Your state never changes your standing. But we want our state to get as close as possible to matching our standing. And this means we need to strive for perfection. And the closer you get to perfection, the more you'll realize how much of a dirty, rotten sinner that you actually are. The Bible says, "...him that thinketh himself to be something when he is nothing deceiveth himself." 1 John 2, 2 says, And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Propitiation, Jesus Christ is our propitiation because he appeased the wrath of God. The wrath of God was abiding on us according to John three thirty six, but Jesus Christ appeased that wrath when we accepted him as our payment for sin. A weapon against the flesh... Our most persistent enemy is to remember what Jesus Christ went through for us because of our sins. He had to die. He had to die on the cross and shed his blood. 1 John 2, 2. And he is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So Jesus Christ died for the sin of every man, even for the sins of those people who will never get saved. Every person currently has their sins paid for, but they refused the payment many times and God wants every man to be saved so he died for the sin of every man past present and future sins are paid for you just have to accept the payment but if you don't accept the payment you die and go to hell every wicked atheist and rapper and rock singer and politician no matter how wicked they are could get saved today if they would come to Jesus Christ Jesus Christ died for the sins of the whole world Every single sin ever committed, even re con constant rejection, constant unbelief, those sins are paid for. You just have to get out of the unbelief and, and believe. Jesus Christ died for the sins of the whole world. That includes the sins of Eminem, Nicki Minaj, Hillary Clinton, Bill Maher, BTK, Ted Bundy, 
the Golden State Killer, the Zodiac, or any other dirty sinner. Jesus said in John 6, 37, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. So he won't by any means tell a sinner no who wants to come to him by faith, not even the sodomite. And if you teach that a sodomite can't get saved, then you're just adding to the simple gospel. You're saying the blood couldn't pay for that sin. And Second Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. First uh, Timothy 2, 4, Who will have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. So God's will is for everyone to be saved, but most will resist and will not get saved. Our flesh is an enemy to having assurance of salvation. And there's been times in my saved life when I didn't know I was saved. And constant unconfessed sin can lead to losing assurance of salvation. 1 John 2, 3 says, And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. You see that? Hereby we do know that we know him. So as a way to keep you living for him, God has it fixed to when you serve him, you have assurance. But when you don't serve him, you can lose that assurance. We do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. And you can be saved and not know it. And when you're backslid, you can forget about God many times. You can forget about everything. Like when you're away from a friend for a while, you come back and they say, you don't even know me anymore. You got away and you forgot about what God did for you. Forgot about the answered prayers. Forgot about the Bible. First John 2, 4, He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. So sinning for a Christian can cause you to lose assurance. Our heart can condemn us. In our heart, we'll think we, we're not saved because we haven't been serving him because of sin. 1 John 3, 20 through 21 says, For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart, and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God. So God has it fixed to where if you are serving him, then the Holy Spirit will give you assurance. Because Paul says in Romans eight sixteen, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. But what's another way to fight the flesh? In 1 John 2, 5, it says, But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected, and hereby know we that we are in him. So we fight the flesh by keeping the word. And we know we are in him because of the promises from the words we are keeping. So once again, it says, Hereby know we that we are in him. It's about assurance. 1 John 5, 13 says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. So imagine sitting under a pastor who didn't know he had eternal life, and he's trying to tell you how to get eternal life when he doesn't even know how to get it himself. Jesus said, If the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into a ditch. But that verse said there in 1 John 5, 13, that you can know that you have eternal life. Uh, next, another enemy. That was the flesh. Now we're going to look at another enemy, which is darkness. And a constant giving into the flesh puts you in darkness. You can walk in darkness and still be saved. Uh, 1 John 2, 6 says, He that abideth in him ought himself also so to walk even as he walked. So if you profess to abide in Jesus Christ, then you need to walk as much like him as, as you can. But there's a chance that you won't. Uh, Proverbs 2, 11 through 13 says, Discretion shall preserve thee, understanding shall keep thee, to deliver thee from the way of the evil man, from the man that speaketh forward things, who leave 
the paths of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness. 1 John 1, 7 says, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all sin. Galatians 5, 16 says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. So if you're having trouble in your Christian walk, it could be because you're walking with the wrong people. And it's a lot easier to walk in the Spirit when you're having uh, people walking in, who are walking in the Spirit around you and not people who are walking in the flesh. 1 John 2, 7 says, Brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment which ye had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which ye have heard from the beginning. So John isn't trying to make a name for himself by teaching something new. He's giving the old commandment. John thirteen thirty four says, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. So what's Jesus saying the new commandment is? That ye love one another. And then Paul even says in Romans thirteen eight, O no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. If you love your brother, then you're not going to break the commandments. Because if you love your brother, you're not going to commit adultery with his wife. You're not going to steal his things. You're not going to lie to him or kill him. 1 John 2, 8. Again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past and the true light now shineth. So, like I said, John wrote this epistle to the church. But it can have more than one application. A man in the future tribulation can read this epistle and get application for himself. Uh, the new commandment for him could be not to take the mark of the beast because that's a new commandment we haven't had before. Uh, no, uh, nowhere is it said that a Christian in the body of Christ must abstain from a certain sin or he'll die and go to hell. But that specific thing to abstain from, a mark of the beast... We've not had before. So that could be that new commandment for him. Uh, 1 John 2, 9 says, He that saith he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. So you see, a Christian can walk in darkness. If you have hate in your heart, then you're a murderer in your heart. Just like you can commit adultery in your heart. 1 John 2, 10 through 11 says, He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness, and walketh in darkness, and knoweth not whither he goeth, because that darkness hath blinded his eyes. So your walk, as I've said so many times before, is different, different than your position in Christ. Your walk can be in darkness, but in Christ you're always in the light. And you must understand your standing versus your state. That's what we're talking about. That is a key to having assurance of salvation. The truth is, no matter what you do when it comes to eternity, you're always going to be in Christ. When it comes to the body, you'll have a sin nature until you die. But another way to look at this verse is, the person in the tribulation can look at these verses and realize he needs to love his brother by doing what the men are said to be doing in Matthew 25. So if you turn to Matthew 25 and look at verse 35, Jesus is at, the, this is the judgment of the nations. And Jesus is talking to these people and he says, For I was unhungered and you gave me meat. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. Naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him and saying, Lord, when saw we thee and hungered and fed thee or thirsty and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer, and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. So you see that the brethren there is the Jews. In the time of Jacob's trouble, when a man is going to have to be, he's going to have to be good to the brethren. The Jewish people and that's what the tribulation person in the tribulation could apply these verses to for himself he that loveth his brother abideth in the light he's going to need to love the brethren
But the next enemy we're going to look at is the wicked one. And looking at this for us today, the wicked one is the devil himself who hates the Christian. But a man in the tribulation could look at these verses and apply it to himself and see it as the wicked one as the Antichrist, which is, you know, the devil in the flesh. But now you have to be careful r running your mouth about the devil. Uh, Michael the archangel didn't bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. And I'm not like that angel that grabs the devil by the horns and chains him in the bottomless pit. I mean, you've got to have some guts to do something like that. But as long as God doesn't want the devil to touch me, he can't touch me. So just pray he'll leave you alone. But 1 John 2.12 says, I write unto you, little children, because our sin, your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. And the wicked one hates that. He doesn't want you to get your sins forgiven. But notice the Bible talks about different stages of spiritual growth. It says little children. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. But God forgave us of our sins for Jesus' sake, not by works of righteousness which we have done. The wicked one wants you to think you got it by your own works of righteousness. 1 John 2.13 says, I write unto you fathers because you have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you young men because you have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you little children because you have known the father. So two more stages of spiritual growth are mentioned here. Little children, young men, and fathers. The young men are said to have overcome the wicked one. The wicked one, of course, is the devil. Your flesh bothers you even when the devil isn't around, but he amps it up a bit. And 1 Peter 5, 8 calls him your adversary. So he gets a chance to be each individual's adversary at one time or another. So be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. If you're born again, then you have overcome the wicked one. Uh, 1 John 4, 4 says, You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So when someone says you have to overcome to be saved, you can say, well, I've already overcome. And since the one in you is greater than greater than the one that's in the world the devil can't take your soul however if you live for the flesh you can take everything else first corinthians 5 5 says to deliver such a one unto satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit might be saved in the day of the lord jesus so your flesh can be t turned over to him but your soul can't first john 2 14 i have written unto you fathers because you have known him that is from the beginning I've written unto you, young men, because ye are strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and ye have overcome the wicked one. So how do we overcome the wicked one in our daily walk? Let the word abide in you. When Jesus Christ was tempted by the devil, he quoted scripture. How much scripture do you know? Would you be able to quote scripture against the devil? Every time that the devil said something to the Lord Jesus Christ, he would just say, it is written. It is written. So how do we overcome the wicked one in our daily walk? Let the word of God abide in you. When Jesus Christ was tempted by the devil, like I said, he quoted scripture, so, so you need to quote scripture. Uh, James 1.12 says, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. So you can endure temptation, just like the Lord Jesus Christ did. Now for the man in the tribulation, the wicked one, as I said, is the Antichrist, the devil in the flesh, and he won't show up until after the church is gone. But they're going to have to overcome his mark. And the desire to worship him, these things will be required to preserve their life because without worshiping him and taking his mark you can't buy or sell but second thessalonians chapter 2 calls him that wicked it talks about that wicked being revealed so while we look at the wicked one as the devil the man in the tribulation will see him as the antichrist because that is where the devil will be doing his main work and john even goes on to speak about the antichrist in verse 18 in this same chapter 
But here in jo in First John, looking at these different stages of spiritual growth, you have the little children, the young men, and the fathers. The Bible also talks about babes in Christ and elders, and Paul calls himself Paul the aged. And something to remember is that everyone is on a different level in their Christian walk. First John 2, 12 says, I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. And when I read this, I think about how when I was a babe and even moved up into a little bit to a little child in Christ, I didn't know much. But one thing I knew, I knew I had my sins forgiven. That's why it says, because our, your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. Uh, at least that's what I'm reminded of when I read that. And then it says, I write unto you fathers because you have known him that is from the beginning. A father in the faith will know the one who is from the beginning better than a little child in the faith is going to know him. First uh, John 2.14 says, I have written unto you fathers because you have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you young men because you are strong and the word of God abideth in you and you have overcome the wicked one. So young men in the faith tend to be more zealous about things and tend to do a lot of service for God. Notice it says they are strong, but something about them is they don't have as much wisdom as the fathers of the faith. So they probably don't know the father as much as some as much as you know someone that's been saved a long time but a continual growth is what we should be striving for but don't forget the good things about each stage the good things about what each stage is known for uh, don't lose the excitement that you once had as a little child when you first found out your sins were forgiven don't lose the zeal you had as a young man but next another enemy i want to talk about is the sinful world 1 John 2.15 says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Romans 2.12 says, And be not conformed to this world. Luke 21.33 says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. The things in this world are temporal, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4.18. The world works on a Christian because the world tempts you to conform but second corinthians 4 4 tells us who the god of this world is that's wanting us to conform it's the devil and first john 2 16 says for all that is in the world the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not in the father but is of the world and the story of adam and eve describes this verse it says the lust of the flesh eve saw that the tree was good for food the lust of the eyes it was pleasant to the sight and the pride of life able to make her wise. So there's a great illustration of that. And 1 John 2, 17 says, And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Everything in the world is temporary. Temporary beauty, temporary thrills, temporary fame and fortune, and material items. You can live in this world... But remember what Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 11.9. He says, Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth, and let thy the heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth, and walk in the ways of thine heart, and in the sight of thine eyes. But know thou that for all these things God will bring thee into judgment. But this has been 1 John chapter 2, verse by verse, and we've looked at Bible believers worst enemies and I'm going to close it out right here but I'll probably do a part two of Bible believers worst enemies because there's still some more enemies in this chapter but if you've made it this far and you're not saved the Bible clearly tells us how to be saved Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15 he says, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. So Jesus Christ died, and he died for your sins. There's no way that you could be saved other than the Lord Jesus Christ, because you can't get there on your own goodness. There's no good thing that you can do that could ever save you. You have to come to him as the guilty sinner that you are to escape hellfire. The Bible says in Romans 10:13, For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. 
The Bible says in Acts 16, 31, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. So if you want to be saved, you simply come to him as the guilty sinner that you are, putting your faith, all your trust on him and what he did on the cross to be your payment for sin. That's all you have to do. So I pray that you'll come to him today before it's too late.